Welcome to Christ or Chaos, a ministry of Village Church in association with Converge Podcast. I'm Chris Bolt, and today we are talking about Muslim myths about Jesus. Now, the way this came about was through picking up a pamphlet at the state fair at a table that the Islamic Center had set up. There was nobody at the table, so I didn't get to talk to anyone about this literature, but I would have wanted to have read the literature before talking to them anyway. Nevertheless, I grabbed this one and several other pamphlets, and I hope to uh, respond to those as well on future episodes of this podcast. Today, also, we're not going to go through the entire pamphlet. We're not going to be able to get that far. There are different sections, as you can see. uh, Jesus is God, Son of God, Father and Lord. Then the pamphlet shifts to making the Muslim case uh, for Jesus as Muslims view him. Jesus the prophet, miraculous birth, miracles of Jesus, message of Jesus, and Jesus in Islam. The name of the pamphlet is Jesus, a prophet of God. And you can see there they've got their heart. So it says Muslims love Jesus as though Muslims love Jesus too. The thing is that Jesus according to Islam and Jesus according to Christianity are two very different things. Well, we're going to look at this pamphlet because I believe it's, it's pretty simple. It's fairly straightforward, and it'll give us uh, an introduction to doing apologetics or defending the Christian faith with respect to Islam, with respect to what Muslims say about the Christian faith. And so we're taking a defensive posture today on the podcast and answering some of the objections that come from Muslim literature toward Christianity, toward the Bible, toward the biblical understanding of Jesus. And so I hope that you'll find this helpful for that reason. They begin in this pamphlet and they write, some Christians claim that Jesus is God. Well, first of all, all Christians claim Jesus is God. That's one of the things that it means to to be a Christian. You have to say that Jesus is God or you are not a Christian. So it's not really true that some Christians claim that Jesus is God or part of a trinity. Well, there is no or there. Uh, Jesus is God and he is uh, a person in the triune God. There is no part of the trinity here. Jesus is not, strictly speaking, a part of the trinity. He is one of the three persons of the trinity. Trinity is not in parts. God does not exist in parts. God exists as one God in three persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and each of these is truly God, and yet there is one God. That he is the incarnation of God on earth. Now, incarnation is simply a word that means enfleshed, uh, in meat, uh, in a body. Uh, the second person of the Trinity, the eternal Son of God, according to Christian doctrine, took on human flesh, took on humanity, a human nature, in addition to his divine nature. And it's understanding that, the miracle of the incarnation, that helps us to understand how to respond to the remainder of this pamphlet. But we're going to revisit that truth over and over again as we look through here. So to read it again, some Christians claim that Jesus is God or part of a trinity, that he is the incarnation of God on earth, and that God took on a human form. However, according to the Bible, so right off the bat, they are attempting to argue using our religious document, right? (laughs) Our revelation from God in the Holy Scriptures. According to the Bible, Jesus was born, ate, slept, prayed, and had limited knowledge. Is that true that the Bible presents Jesus as being born, eating, sleeping, praying, and having limited knowledge? Yes, it is. It is absolutely true that the Bible describes Jesus in those ways. But they say all attributes not befitting God. Is that true? Well, yes, it is. God, who is an all-powerful, all-knowing, all-present, eternal being, God is not born. He's always existed. He's eternal. God does not eat. He is spirit. Uh, God does not sleep. He never sleeps. He's all-knowing, and he's all-powerful. He doesn't have to sleep. God does not pray uh, in the sense of uh, making his request known to another god, Uh, and God does not have limited knowledge. God Uh, is omniscient, all-knowing, 
All these attributes, they say, are not befitting to God. So that seems to present somewhat of a problem. They continue, God has attributes of perfection, which we've just now talked about. God has attributes of perfection, whereas man is the opposite. Now, strictly speaking, that's not true. It's not that man is the opposite of God per se. In Christianity, we believe that God created man in his own image. And God, after having created man on that sixth day, he says, it's good. God called it good. Man, in fact, was created upright. He was sufficient to stand and yet able to fall. But just in virtue of the fact of being creaturely rather than the creator, there is no sin or imperfection. In in other words, the creation is a good thing. God calls it good. It's not the same as God. There is a creator-creation distinction But man, being man, initially, is not thereby imperfect. Nor is Jesus, by the way, in virtue of being man, imperfect. Now, what they are getting at, I believe, is simply that man is not a perfect being in the sense of perfect being theology. God possessing these attributes like being all-powerful and all-knowing and all-present. I once had a student who said, you know, you could say that God is the omni-omnis. He possesses the all-alls. He is all of the alls you can think of. He exhibits every maximal perfection. He is the perfect being. In that sense, they're right. But they ask, how can anything be two complete opposites simultaneously? And this is where our Christian theology comes in to clarify things for us. When we look at Scripture, we can summarize the teachings of Scripture in this way. Jesus Christ possesses two natures, divine and human, and he possesses these two natures in his person, the one person. This is the big word that theologians use to describe this, is the hypostatic union. You have the deity, the, the, the divinity, the divine nature, and you have the human, creaturely nature. And those two natures are together in the person of Christ without being mixed. One person, two natures. And so we are not saying, and this is important, both for biblical reasons, but also for logical reasons. We believe in logic As Christians, God has created our minds to function in logical ways so that we obey his thoughts. We we think his thoughts after him. God is a God of rationality and order, and he is not uh, telling us to be illogical or alogical. And so when we look at his word, because it is a revelation of God and all that he is, God has made it such that we are able to look at the different texts of Scripture and put them together systematically to come to a fuller understanding of what it is that he is telling us about himself. And so when we look at Scripture, we come to these claims that work out in this way logically. We are not saying that God is God and not God. God and not God is an actual opposite. To say that God is God and not God is to affirm a contradiction. We're not affirming a contradiction. We're not saying that God is God and not God. Or, we're not saying that, or we're not saying that Jesus is man and not man. We're not saying man and not man. That, again, would be a contradiction. It is not the case that Jesus can be both man and not man at the same time and in the same respect. That would be contradictory. So we're not saying Jesus is God and not God. We're not saying that Jesus is man and not man. We're not saying that he stopped being God and became man. What we are saying is that Jesus, the person of Christ, is both God and man. Jesus is both God and and man, divine and human, in the one person, Christ. That will help us with the rest of this pamphlet, but especially as we look at this section called Jesus as God. 
Islam, we're told in this pamphlet, and these are direct quotes from Jesus, a prophet of God, learn the basics, gain peace through Islam. Islam teaches that God is always perfect. Well, Christianity teaches that God is always perfect. To believe that God became a man is to claim that God is or was at some point in time imperfect. Now, we already addressed that in that creation is not uh, well spoken of as imperfect initially anyway. The reason that there are imperfect imperfections in creation now is because man sinned against God. And so sin came into the world and death came in through sin. This world is under the curse of sin. We live in what's called a Genesis 3 world. Genesis 3 describes the fall of man into sin. But uh, a Christian must, according to this pamphlet, ask him or herself, does the idea of a God who was once a weak, helpless child, one who could not survive without food, drink, or sleep, be the same almighty God described in the Old Testament? Surely not, they say. Well, this is what's just called an argument from incredulity, first of all. Uh, surely not. This cannot be the case that this powerful God becomes weak in this way. But technically speaking, we're not saying that God became man as though God transitioned into something other than what he was. Again, we're not saying God and not God. We're not saying man and not man. We're saying that Jesus Christ, the person of Christ, is God and man. That bears repeating because it is such a simple blunder to make in your representation of Christianity when you, you, you get that wrong and you go talking about it being God and not God or man and not man. No, Jesus is both God and man. Uh, does this idea then of a God who was once a weak, helpless child, well, Jesus is God, but Jesus is also man. So how is it that Jesus can be the almighty God described in the Old Testament while also being this weak, helpless child who can't survive without food, drink, or sleep because this God of the Old Testament, Yahweh, the second person of the Trinity, the eternal Son, adds to himself, takes on to himself a human nature. And so it's not that the nature is needing uh, food or drink or sleep. The person still needs those things, but the person of Christ needs them in virtue of his human nature, not in virtue of his divine nature. This is simply what it means to work out the logical entailments of the incarnation and the hypostatic union. One may ask, they continue, if God can do anything, why can't he become a man? Well, that is a good question. We're not talking about God denying himself or changing or lying. There are things that God cannot do because they're not in accord with his holy will. Okay, God's omnipotence means that he's not restricted or restrained by anything outside of himself. It's only his own nature that dictates what he can uh, do or not do in that regard. But one may ask, they say, if God can do anything, why can't he become a man? Well, I would rephrase that question. If God can do anything, why can't he take a human nature on to himself as the Bible teaches that he does. By the way, that's John 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God, the same was in the beginning with God. And then you skip down to verse 14 of John chapter 1, and it says that the Word took on flesh and dwelt among us or tabernacled among us. There's the addition of a second nature, the addition of the human nature. If God can do anything, why can't he become a man? By definition, they say, God does not do ungodly acts. Well, it wouldn't be an ungodly act for God to take on the human nature because the human nature is not inherently flawed, as we've already discussed. Creation was good at the beginning. God does not do anything that would make him something other than God. Okay, but he remains God while adding a second nature, the nature of humanity, to himself. If God became man and took on human attributes, he would necessarily no longer be God. Well, we've just demonstrated that does not follow at all. He is, in fact, necessarily God, but when he adds to himself these human attributes, that is something other than what he is as God. That is, that's the creaturely attributes. That, those are the human attributes. It's not that he ceases being God. He remains God. We affirm the full deity of Christ while also affirming his full humanity. They continue some ambiguous verses of the Bible. Well, that's not true. But some ambiguous verses of the Bible can be applied erroneously. That's also not true. 
to show that Jesus is in some way divine. Well, there are plenty of passages of Scripture where Jesus is divine, but it's not merely that they show that he's divine. They demonstrate that he is the Son of God. Every miracle, every sign or omen that Jesus performs, it's not a mere magic trick. It is an indication and an evidence that Jesus Christ is who he says he is, who others say he is, the Son of God. But if we look, they continue, at the clear, direct verses of the Bible, which is interesting that they now use clear and direct as opposed to what they were calling ambiguous and erroneous a moment ago. This is what's called poisoning the well. They're trying to get you to think about these, oh, these verses that are not as clear and they're even full of error and they might imply in some way that Jesus was partly divine. Verses, the clear and direct verses of the Bible, um, which they think is going to make their point, but it doesn't. See, if we look at these clear and direct verses of the Bible, we see again and again that Jesus is being referred to as an extraordinary human being and nothing more. Well, no, those verses don't establish that at all. When you look at Jesus performing miracles, nothing about that any of those passages, says anything about Jesus being a mere human uh, being and nothing more. The Bible, they continue, contains many verses in which Jesus speaks and behaves as if God is a separate being to himself. Well, I would just say that they need to be able to distinguish here between seeing verses that describe Jesus speaking and behaving as if God is a separate being, um, rather than seeing verses where Jesus speaks and behaves as if God is uh, is a separate person. You see, the issue here is not one of distinction of being when Jesus uh, talks and acts as though God is separate from him. He's not saying that God is a separate being. He's saying that whomever it is he's speaking to is a separate person. And so they say, here's an example of Jesus speaking and acting as though God is a separate being right here. They say, Jesus, quote, fell on his face and prayed, Matthew 26, 39. And they ask, if Jesus was God, which by the way, if Jesus was God, he still is. If Jesus was God, then would a God fall on his face and pray? And who would he be praying to? Now, remember, they're trying to establish that God is a separate being from Jesus here. And I'm arguing that God here is a separate person, not a separate being. The Son of God and the Father share in essence or being. They are God. Okay. The other thing that I'm going to argue here. Well, let's just let's just go to the actual passage of scripture. Matthew 26:39, going a little further, he that's Jesus fell on his face and prayed. Now, why would he fall on his face? Well, to have a face, he has to be a human. And why would he fall? Well, to fall you have to be a human. Right? I mean, I guess animals fall too, but for the purposes and the context of what we're talking about, and he prayed. Well, well, there's nothing wrong. Uh, there's nothing contradictory or immoral or anything like that um, with the idea of one person of the Trinity speaking to another. In fact, we're told in John 17 that the glory was shared between Father, Son, and Spirit from eternity. Uh, the three persons of the Trinity love one another from eternity, Father, Son, and Spirit. And what is talking to one another other than prayer in that sense, right? So there's something else added to this equation, though, the human nature of Jesus. There are things that the Son of God could not do without taking on that human nature, And some of those things are described in this verse. This doesn't undermine the Christian faith. This just is the Christian faith, that Jesus Christ is able now, having a human nature in addition to his divine nature, he is able now to fall on his face and to pray. Who does he pray toward? Well, he doesn't pray to himself. He prays to the Father. My Father, if it be possible, 
Let this cup pass from me, nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. And so this does not prove that there is a distinction in essence or being between the Father and the Son. Rather, it shows that there's a distinction of person, Father, and Son, which just is Christian belief. It does not disprove that the Son of God um, is the Son of God. It does not disprove that he took on a human nature. It does not show that there's any contradiction here whatsoever. And by the way, it's important that we see we should go to the Word of God, to the verse that's quoted or cited, and not just take it for granted that somebody who's challenging your Christian faith really knows what they're talking about, because when we look at the passage, it gives us a lot more context and understanding of what's going on. We're not going to get more into that right now. We need to move along, but they continue with the same sort of argument, and here the context really is going to make a big difference. They write, the Bible calls Jesus a prophet. So how could Jesus be God and be God's prophet at the same time? Well, first of all, there is no contradiction between Jesus being God and being a prophet of God at the same time. I don't know why that would be a problem at all. Uh, being a prophet of God, a mouthpiece for God, speaking for God doesn't necessarily mean that you're other than God. In fact, even when prophets in the Old Testament who are merely human and not God speak, they speak on behalf of God, and to obey or disobey their voice in the Old Testament is to obey or disobey the voice of God. But this is important because they say here, notice what they say, the Bible calls Jesus a prophet. Well, we need to say, see who it is in the Bible who's calling Jesus a prophet. Matthew 21, 10 through 11, and when he, that is Jesus, entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred up saying, who is this? And the crowds said, this is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth of Galilee. Now, sometimes the cities described in the text of Scripture and the crowds described in the text of Scripture and the individuals described in the text of Scripture, just because they say something doesn't necessarily mean that it's true. Now, it happens to be true here. I'm going to get to that in a moment. But always go back to the context to make sure that we're getting our details correct, because they could have a bearing upon what we come to believe about the text of Scripture and what God is trying to tell us through his holy word. Well, the crowds say this is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth of Galilee. Now, recognizing him as a prophet does not immediately mean that he's not God. There's nothing that follows in that way whatsoever. And I would add that Christians do, in fact, believe, just as we had, so here's how it works. We have a prophetic office in the Old Testament where God speaks to his people through his holy prophets, okay? We also have kings all through the Old Testament who rule and reign over God's people. We also have priests through the Old Testament. Testament, who offer sacrifices on behalf of the people. And what we believe as Christians is that all of these Old Testament offices, they are types and shadows of what is to come. And so Jesus actually perfectly fulfills those three offices. Jesus is the perfect prophet. Jesus is the perfect king. Jesus is the perfect priest. He is the prophet who is the very word of God. He is the king who is Lord over all. And he is the priest who offers himself a perfect sacrifice for our sins as he dies on the cross, is buried, and then raised again, showing that God has vindicated him and demonstrating that he is both just and the justifier of, of the ones who place their faith in him. God is the just and uh, just one and the justifier of those who place their faith in Jesus Christ. So we are forgiven of our sins. We're counted right in God's sight through union with Christ, through faith in him and his work on our behalf. We're forgiven. We're counted right in his sight. So he is that sacrifice. He is that priest who offers that up just as he's the king, just as he's the prophet. There are bad prophets in the Old Testament. There are bad kings in the Old Testament. There are bad priests in the Old Testament. Jesus is not those. He fulfills these offices in a way that all of the precursors to him could not. And so that's just simple, basic 
Christian theology. What's being brought up here is not an objection to our view at all. We affirm it, and we affirm it without contradiction or problem or difficulty. So Jesus is a prophet, yes, but he's more than a prophet. Jesus is also God. Uh, Finally, they say, Jesus said, I am going to the Father because the Father is greater than me. And they quote here, John 14, 8. Well, here again, uh, when Jesus is going to the Father because the Father is greater than him, it does not entail, logically speaking, it doesn't entail in terms of the context of this passage that Jesus is less than God. It's not a uh, greater than issue here in terms of equality with God, in terms of the divine essence, in terms of the divine being. And so what is it? Well, it's one of two things or maybe both. Jesus has taken on human nature, and in the humanity of Jesus, again, his nature doesn't do anything. Human nature itself doesn't do anything. The person is always the one speaking and acting. But the person of Christ acts through the human nature in submission to the Father. And so he is going back to the Father. He's going to ascend to him because the Father is greater than him in terms of his earthly authority. The Father has the authority, and Jesus says what? All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth, right? So Jesus ascends to the Father to show that all of his work here on earth as a man is done, okay? It is finished in his cross work, his death, burial, resurrection for our sins in our place, his ascension to the right hand of God the Father. It could also then refer to the mediatorial office of Jesus Christ. There is one mediator between God and man, the man Jesus Christ. And that does involve what's called the economic work of the Trinity, the Father sending the Son, the Son then sends the Spirit. And so that is also something just simply that Christians believe without fear of logical contradiction at all. Jesus said, I ascend unto my Father and your Father and to my God and your God. If Jesus was God, they asked, then why would he say to my God and your God? And who was he ascending to? Well, he's ascending to God and he is God, but he's ascending specifically to God the Father. And we already addressed that. If Jesus was God, he would have clearly told people to worship him, and there would be clear verses in the Bible stating this, yet he did the opposite and disapproved anyone worshiping him, and in vain they worship me. Well, they're quoting here from Matthew 15, 9. Once again, we need to look at the context. Let me break down this paragraph, though, right before we uh, wrap this up. If Jesus was God, he would have clearly told people to worship him. Well, that's what they say. I don't know why that would ever follow. And there would be clear verses in the Bible stating this. Again, that's what they say. Yet he did the opposite. Well, no, he did not. And he did not disapprove anyone worshiping him. The one text that they quote here is Matthew 59, and in vain they worship me. But when we go to that actual passage, here's the context. Matthew chapter 15 and verse 1 Then Pharisees and scribes came to Jesus from Jerusalem. So the Pharisees and scribes are coming to Jesus, and Jesus is going to respond to them. And here's what he says to them uh, in verse 6. So for the sake of your tradition, you've made void the word of God. You hypocrites, well did Isaiah prophesy of you when he said, this people honors me with their lips. Now, who is Isaiah speaking on behalf of there? He's speaking on behalf of God. Even if you believe Jesus is a mere man here, Jesus is still quoting from Isaiah, the prophet, who is giving us the very word of God, God the Father. This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching his doctrines, the commandments of men. Now, what we're going to see in a moment is, this is actually the word of Yahweh, Uh, with whom Jesus is identified in the New Testament as well, establishing that Jesus is God, Jesus is deity. Uh, But my point here is simply to say that the, the Muslims in this pamphlet have ripped this verse out of its context. They're claiming, remember, they're claiming that Jesus is refusing worship. Jesus is saying, well, in vain do you worship me. In other words, it's foolish to worship me. Don't worship me because I'm not God. 
But nothing of the sort is being said in this text. Rather, he is quoting from Isaiah. And Isaiah says, this on behalf of God, this people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain do they worship me, meaning the people are hypocritical. Their hearts are far away. They're, they're saying these nice things about God with their mouths, but their lives don't bear it out. And so their worship itself is not acceptable or pleasing to God. That's what's taking place all through the book of Isaiah. In vain do they worship mean. It does not mean that God is refusing worship from his people. It means that he is disgusted with this vain and futile worship that they are bringing him because they are not obeying him in the first place. That's the theme of the book of Isaiah. They teach his doctrines, the commandments of men. So in no way does this establish that Jesus refused worship from his people. But what is going on in Isaiah? Well, John 12, this is not in their pamphlet, but in John 12, I'm going to offer just a little positive apologetic here. In John 12, 36 through 38, and then verse 41, The context there says that when Jesus had said these things, he departed and hid himself from them. Though he had done so many signs before them, which is an evidence of his divinity, they still did not believe in him. Now that's interesting in and of itself because the Muslim literature here has said that Jesus merely performed these miracles Uh, as a prophet of God, and the people recognized him as a prophet. Well, if the people recognized him as a prophet, that's not believing in him the way Jesus wants to be believed in. And, And the people clearly saw the miracles. They believed that he had performed miracles, and yet that's also not believing in him in the way that he uh, expects here. So what does it mean to believe in him? Though he had done so many signs before them, though he was considered a prophet even, they still did not believe in him. Well, that means they did not receive him as the Messiah. They did not receive him as God's son. They did not receive him as the Davidic king. They did not receive him as the perfect prophet, priest, and king, the divine son of God who has come to save them. Why not? so that the word spoken by the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled. Why did Isaiah say these things? Verse 41, Isaiah said these things because he saw his glory and spoke of him. Now you can go look up that passage in John 12 if you want and read the full context. It's merely quoting from the book of Isaiah and the things that happened in his day as he's a prophet sent out to this hard-hearted people who would see but not see and hear but not hear. And so Isaiah is sent to them after seeing someone seated upon the throne. Now pay attention again to John. When Jesus had said these things, it's talking about Jesus. And then it says in verse 41, Isaiah said these things because Isaiah saw his glory and spoke of him. Well, in the context, that's talking about Jesus. Isaiah saw the glory of Christ and spoke of Christ. When did that happen? When did Isaiah see him, see Jesus? Isaiah chapter 6, verses 1 through 3. In the year that King Uzziah died, I, that's Isaiah writing, saw the Lord sitting upon a throne high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him stood the seraphim, each had six wings, with two he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew, and one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. That's Yahweh of armies, the Lord of hosts, who we know to be, based on the word of God, the one who took on human flesh and came and dwelt among us, Jesus Christ, God and man in one person. And so that's the beginning of what will no doubt become a series, Muslim myths about Jesus, responding to Jesus, a prophet of God. Thank you for listening today. This has been Christ or Chaos with Chris Bolt. Do you know someone who needs to hear this? Go ahead, without thinking, go ahead and send it to them now. Uh, They can put it on me instead of on you. If you know someone who needs to hear this, either to evangelize a Muslim neighbor or because they are Muslim, or they just need some clarity regarding the person and the work 
of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, send this their way. And don't forget yourself to hit like, subscribe, share this with others, spread it around on your social media platforms. Thank you for tuning in, and I hope to see you again soon.